And Tass, I really appreciate you following along with questions because I was worried about whether or not I was going to keep up. Oh, good. It looks like pretty much everybody can hear me. Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to clear out those responses now. Okay. Wonderful. Moving on. Okay. Garden weeds. So we're talking about weeds. And of course, everybody knows there's a million and one weeds, right? So I'm going to only be able to touch on a few weeds for this class. There's lots of them out there. Um, they plague us terribly. But unfortunately, I can't go through all of them. Oh, excuse me. Anybody calling? Okay, that was bad timing. So um, I can't go through all of them today, but I will certainly try to hit some of the ones that I know are in our area and some of the ones that are kind of the worst offenders, so to speak. Um, so let's move along here. So it helps when we're talking about a topic as big as weeds to separate things into portions that we can kind of categorize things in. It also helps to know how the weeds grow so that you know when to look for them. That way you can get rid of them more quickly. So I separated things into um, cool season and warm season weeds. And this isn't my idea. This is you know, the way that a lot of people talk about weeds. So we're gonna start with cool season weeds. Those are the ones you're actually seeing out there right now because we've had a nice long cool spring. Um, so they like the cool weather, they germinate in the cooler soils. They can be annuals, perennials, or biennials, which we're gonna go into what all those are later. They are the first weeds of spring. So unfortunately, they get a hold on things, maybe even before you're ready to get out in the garden. So they're, they're kind of the first ones. You gotta get on top of them pretty quick. They will fade during the warm days of summer, but then resurge in the fall. And I know what you're thinking, oh, well, they're gonna fade. So, you know, if I just wait, they'll just go away. But unfortunately, uh, they'll go to seed before they uh, fade during the warm days. And then you'll have an even bigger problem in the fall, because of course we have two cool seasons, right? We have spring and fall. So you'll see some of these weeds right now, and then you'll see them again in October and November. Some of them are even evergreen, and you can find them underneath the snow. Um, so four examples of cool season weeds are ground ivy, chickweed, lamb's quarters, and garlic mustard. And I'm going to go clockwise from the upper left hand corner. The first one that's ground ivy, the one to the right of that is chickweed. Then there's the lamb's quarters, bottom right corner. And then bottom left corner is the garlic mustard. So some of you may have these. We have all of these on our farm. Um, there are, I'll go into more detail about like how to identify them, so on and so forth. It's really easy when things are flowering to identify them. It's a lot easier. But when they're not flowering, which is when it's really important to identify them, um, it's a little bit harder. So we'll go into that as well. Uh, Cause of course, once they flower, then they're gonna do what? They're gonna set seed. And once they set seed, it's a lot harder to get rid of them because they will unfortunately set a lot of seeds <laughs> because that's what weeds do. Okay. So those are some cool season weeds that you'll see now. Then we're gonna get into the warm season weeds. They're just kind of the opposite. They like the warm weather. They can be, of course, annuals, perennials, or biennials, same thing. They usually don't appear until the weather is warm, so you don't really see them right away, but they may germinate, the seeds might, may germinate now when, when it's still cool. So you may see them when they're kind of small right now, but then by August, you're like, whoa, where did this come from? <laughs> Those are warm season weeds for sure. Some examples are burdock, Queen Anne's lace, Sulfur sink foil, which is one of those weeds you've probably seen but didn't know what it was called because there's a lot of those out there, I'm sure. 
and foxtail grass. There are actually two or three different kinds of foxtail grass, but they're all the same in that they look like a foxtail. So there's several, several kinds of those. Okay. So again, clockwise from the upper left-hand corner. The first one there is burdock. And burdock, as some of you may know, is how um, Velcro came along. If you look at the little spines, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you look at the little spines, um, they're actually the hook part of Velcro. And the guy who invented Velcro got the idea from burdock. So when they <laughs> cling to you, try not to curse them too hard because Velcro is a pretty useful thing. I use it a lot. So that's the one on the upper left. Upper right, lots of people know this one, Queen Anne's Lace. It's got that dark um, flower in the center. Also called wild carrot is another common name for it. And then bottom left, that is the sil uh, sulfur sink foil. And it's pretty, actually. I keep some of them because they're so pretty. Um, and it's related to roses. They're in the same family as roses, which if you look at that um, flower, you can see why most roses have five petals. Um, at least, you know, they start out with that. Once they've been hybridized enough, they often have a lot more than that. Um, let's see. Okay. Hang on just a second. Okay. Tess, if you're still listening, I just got an email from somebody who said they were having a problem logging on. I'm gonna just forward that to you because I'd have to get out of this. Um, hang on guys, sorry. I also, so I also just sent it out um, to everyone again. So if those of okay. you who are on re-receive a link, um, it's just because we're trying to get everyone on here. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about that later. I sent it out a few hours ago and I don't know what happened. I'm not sure why everybody didn't get it. But I apologize and thank you all for your patience because, well, there's some challenges when it comes to technology, like I said. So. Um, so anyway, bottom left corner, that sulfur, sulfur sink foil. It's also related to uh, a, a sink foil that you can buy at the nursery and plant in your garden. They're all very closely related. And yeah, so I think the flowers are actually really pretty. And you know what they say about weeds, right? They're just a flower in the wrong place. So some, some of the weeds on our farm, we actually will leave if they're not going to interfere with the crop. And it makes for a meadow effect in some places that I really love. So, um, and then the foxtail grass in the bottom right. This is once it's gone to seed already. And by this time, it's too late to do much about those seeds. So you want to get at it when it's still green, if possible. Okay. So we're going to talk about the kinds of weeds. Um, so you got, you've got cool season and you've got warm season. Now we're also going to talk about perennials, annuals, or biennials. Um, this is pretty important when it comes to controlling them because, especially with biennials, you can have, you can have a, a better effect, a stronger, you know, removal, more success at removing them if you get them during their first year and I'll explain about that more later. So perennials come back every single year. They have a crown just like the perennials in your garden and they regenerate from that crown. Often they will spread either by rhizomes which are underground stems or they may go to seed or the crown may divide. If you've got hostas that's a classic crown division type of spread. So they spread slower 
and they spread because of that crown that just keeps kind of getting bigger, which is why when you divide hostas, you can just chop them up <laughs> and give them to your neighbors, as long as you stay six feet apart, of course. So annuals are, um, they die every year. So they will reseed themselves every year, but the original plant, the crown of the plant dies. So, um, it's just like the annuals you buy again at the nursery, same thing. Biennials are, they have two stages in their life. The very first year that they live, so the seed sprouts, you know, the sprout grows, it's just a leafy basil rosette the first year. That means a, a rosette is like a, a round form of leaves. So, um, if you've ever seen a burdock, it's got several leaves coming from a central point where the crown is. That's just called a rosette. Just it's it's the name of the shape basically, and they're usually pretty low to the ground. These basil rosettes that first year, and then the second year they kind of take a <laughs> take a big leap. They bolt. They flower. They go to seed, and that's where you find the problem, of course, because you don't want them to do that. So if you can learn to identify biennial weeds that first year when they're just a leafy basil rosette and they look innocuous and like they're gonna be harmless, you can pull them out pretty easily. Burdock might be an exception because it's got a pretty good taproot. Um, and prevent that bolting, flowering, going to seed phase in year two. So. That's one of the most important things you can figure out about um, biennial weeds. So let me check my notes here. So the thing with biennials too is you, the, the plants are not very orderly. So you can have a patch of first year plants, the basil rosette, right next to ones that are actually bolting and flowering. So they don't all do the same phase at the same time. So they can do it different at different times, you know, so you'll have a single, a first year plant right next to a second year plant. Okay. Patty, oh. you have a quick question. Okay. Um, so from Kay Davis, um, said, I had good luck getting rid of burdock by cutting it at ground level before going to seed. I'd be very interested to know if that approach will work with wild parsnip. Okay. Ooh, wild parsnip. Okay. Well, wild parsnip for, first of all, you have to be real careful with, if, it, uh, if people don't know what that is, it looks a lot like Queen Anne's lace, but it's got a yellow umbel of flowers at the top instead of white. There's a lot of it on the roadsides around here. You can have a um, reaction to the juices. What happens is when the juices land on your skin, the rays of the sun, have a chemical reaction to the juices and you can come away with very bad burns. So whenever you handle wild parsnip, make sure you're very careful and wear gloves. Don't ever do it with bare skin. And in fact, interesting fact, we let our cultivated parsnips go to seed one year so that I could gather the seeds. And um, I got a reaction from those too. So they are very closely related. Um, so most taproot plants that won't work, I don't believe, but the parsnips and the wild carrots, I believe are kind of a semi-hardy perennial. So like dandelions, everybody knows, right? If you don't get the taproot, it'll, it'll continue to grow. That's why you see those weird dandelions that have like 20 different plants coming out of one because you've pulled it 20 times and each time it, it just keeps trying to, to regenerate. 
So I'm not real sure, honestly, if that would work for them, but it, it's probably more likely to work for, for them than it would for something like a dandelion. Um, I've tried that trick with burdocks too, and it's actually not worked for me. So maybe I haven't gone down far enough. So tap-rooted tap things are tricky. So I don't know if that answers your question. If you, if you want, um, Tess, get her email address and I'll do a little research on that. Okay, let's see. So let's talk about the biennials first. So here on your upper left hand of this uh, corner of the screen, that's a burdock leaf. They can be a little smaller than that, a little fuzzier than that. This one looks like it's growing in some shade. And because the fuzziness on leaves is often a reaction to a lot of sun, it helps preserve moisture on the leaves. This one doesn't look nearly as fuzzy as the ones that I have out growing in the sun. Um, but that's what it looks like in year one. It's a little difficult to tell that there's a basil rosette there, but there are a couple leaves around the middle. I have some very good examples of this on the farm and you can see, you know, the, the center of the plant, you can see it very easily. And you can see how the, the leaves radiate out around that center. So there's your basil rosette. The funny thing is, is when burdock is in its first year, the root is very fleshy and you have this little basil rosette and you try to go, you know, dig up that root and it goes to China. It's kind of crazy. It's this tiny little plant, but it's got this really long tap root. So, um, for once they bolt, which is in the bottom right of the screen, um, they actually use up a lot of the nutrients in that tap root and the roots are, are a lot easier to get out once they bolt. So they're a little woodier too. So that, those are biennials. So you, if you can get it out in that first year, you're gonna save yourself the hassle of the second year flowering and uh, going to seed. Then we have uh, the upper right hand corner is garlic mustard. Now garlic mustard is definitely one of those things where people are like, where did all that come from? Because it has this pretty innocuous looking leaves right here. And if you step on them or crush them in any way, you can smell the garlic for sure. And if you reach down there, you can pull them out very easily in the, the spring after it rains or something. They're very easy to pull out. And they're not hard to pull out once they reach the flowering stage, bottom left corner of the screen, those little white flowers. But you run the risk of them continuing their life cycle. They're a very strange invasive species. They are uh, the... Um, the government has classified them as an invasive species in pretty much every state. They'll grow just about anywhere. And they, um, they will go to seed and continue their life cycle after you pick them once they've bloomed. So um, we used to have, I used to lead a bunch of volunteers doing garlic mustard pulls every spring and fall because they do have a resurgence in the fall. And we would go along and we would pick them and bag them, unfortunately, because if you don't put them in a plastic bag, they will finish their life cycle really fast because you stress them out by pulling them out and they'll go to seed. So if you toss those on your compost pile, you're gonna have a bigger problem. So you definitely don't want to do that. So, um, but amazingly enough, you can also eat garlic mustard. <laughs> There's a few of these th things, actually. I've got recipes in here. You can eat some of them. The garlic mustard tastes pretty good. It tastes very garlicky and a little oniony. So if you are, uh, if you like a, a challenge, go online to get more recipes, but I'll have a, a recipe for you in a minute. Okay. So Going on to annual weeds, um, annual weeds, all weeds really produce a lot of seeds. 
But annual weeds, because they kind of get one shot a year and they have to restart themselves every year, they usually produce a lot more seeds than like perennials and stuff like that. Um, if you can identify them before they go to seed, you can save yourself some serious headaches. We have some pretty big problems with some grass plants, uh, grass weeds on our farm. And once I realized that this tiny little sprout that was maybe a half an inch tall that looked like it was not going to turn into the giant monster that it does, <laughs> once I realized what those were, that it was this this grass, I believe it's goose grass or quack grass. Sorry, I believe it's quack grass. Um, then I started going after those guys every time I saw them, and it do definitely makes a big difference. So um, that's one of the tricks with annuals. So let's look at some annuals. Um, upper left, that's um, lamb's quarters, and Lamb's Quarters starts out as a tiny little seedling that has a purple stem and a couple of leaves. And if you let it go, it becomes a tree. But they can get probably three and a half, four feet tall. Um, they are related to, they are actually related to um, spinach. They're in the same family as spinach. They are edible. They are delicious. One year we had such a bad problem, I canned them and I had nine pints of canned lamb's quarters. And in other countries, they're actually grown as a food crop. They're grown just like spinach. And the, the other name for them is wild spinach. And they, they really are delicious. So that's one thing you can do if you have a lamb's quarters problem, which we do. I think it was in a, a load of manure that we got from one of our neighbors. Lots of weed seeds in that. So we, we battle that one every year and I try to eat as much as I can. <laughs> it was good for you. Why not? Um, so the one on the right is that foxtail grass again. And the thing with those is if you don't get them early, if you wait till they're at this stage, the minute you touch them, the seeds just scatter everywhere. So it's very important to, to try and get them as early as you can. Let's see, how are we doing on questions? Do we have any more questions? None right now, thank you. Okay. All right, so moving on to perennials. So perennials, like I said, just like the perennials in your garden, they survive from year to year. They can have pretty serious root systems because every, every year you leave them there, they get bigger. They're often related to cultivated plants, like I mentioned earlier about the rose, um, the sulfur zinc foil being related to the roses. And unfortunately, often they have to be hand weeded. That's because of that serious root system. They're not something you can just typically pop out with a hoe unless you get them when they're, you know, pretty young. Um, but if you don't get to them right away, they develop a real, really nice root system and you really need to hand weed them out. So. Some perennial weeds like quack grass, goldenrod have pervasive rhizomes that are hard to control. So this quack grass, and goldenrod. Rhizomes are, like I said, an underground stem. I'll have a picture of that. But first, let's talk about the Queen Anne's lace and the sulfur sink foil. So the Queen Anne's lace, like I said, is a short-lived perennial. And if you've ever grown carrots in your garden, you know how sometimes they survive the winter and sometimes they don't. And it depends a lot on the severity of the winter, on how much snow cover there is. If there's snow cover, it's very likely you can dig your carrots in the spring or in the January thaw that we often get. Same with Queen Anne's lace. So sometimes they'll survive, the roots will survive the winter and sometimes they won't based upon the kind of winter we have. 
and then the sil uh, sulfur sink foil to the right. The easiest way to identify this one when it's young is the leaves actually look like cannabis. I've had several people say, is that cannabis <laughs> at our farm? And it's not, it's sulfur sink foil. That's what it ends up doing. And you can kind of see in the background of the picture, some of that shape. So it does resemble it pretty closely. Um, again, it's in the rose family and they also spread by seed. Queen Anne's lace will also spread by seed. Um, you know, weeds spread in a multitude of ways oftentimes. That's why they're so successful. And then perennials with rhizomes. So this is two pictures. The biggest picture, that's the goldenrod. We have, well, I'm sure if you've uh, looked around or dr driven around during September and you notice all the yellow mountains, it's mostly because of one species of goldenrod called common field or old field goldenrod. And the reason we have so much of it is because of the rhizomes that you see in front of you. So that long white root looking thing is not actually a root, it's a stem, but it's a stem that can grow anywhere between a couple inches below the soil and eight inches below the soil. And so those rhizomes are a big problem with things like um, Canada thistle, the goldenrods, several grasses, um, because even if you dig up this length of rhizome like I did in our bed here, uh, if you leave a small section of it that has a little growing point on it, it will grow and it'll start coming back. So dandelions don't bother me. These guys <laughs> really bother me. We have a, we have a hard time. So um, I'll get into ways to control them or at least keep them from stealing too many nutrients from your, your plants that you want to grow. So rhizomes, huh, a lot of invasive species spread that way too. Um, Japanese knotweed spreads by rhizomes. It's a real, real big problem. Okay, let's see. Now we're going to try a pull. Never done a pull. Okay. So I'm going to launch a pull. Let's see. Bernice has a question. I always thought Queen Anne's lace was a biennial. Well, not that, not that I read when I did the research. Um, I read that it was a that it was a half hardy perennial. So now, if it, if it's that, bear with me here while I think through this. So it's possible because if you've ever grown perennials from seed, they don't flower in the first year. But all that means is that it's not old enough yet. So what I would guess, Bernice, is that it's a half hardy perennial, but possibly during that first year, if it's growing from seed, it's not going to flower. So it'll, you'll just see the leaves and the, the leafy growth, and then it would flower the second year. But after the second year, it's possible it can reflower if it survives the winter. So that's not the same as being a biennial. That, that's just, that has more to do with the age of the plant. Um, from seed, if that makes sense. So just like a perennial. So the, the fact that it can survive the winter immediately makes it not a biennial. Because biennials, once they do their flowering and going to seed, they're gone. They die. They never come back. So you're welcome. Okay, we're going to take a little poll now. I was just curious about um, how many of you who are attending the class were enrolled in the Planting with Purpose one? So I'm going to launch the poll and you go ahead and answer and it'll show me percentages and I'll let you know.
Okay, well, we've got about 80% in, and it looks like 24% had enrolled in planting with purpose and 76% had not. Well, wonderful, either way, welcome. And I'm gonna send out a um, survey after the class. And if you wouldn't mind answering a few questions, we I like to know, being the Ag Program Coordinator, I especially like to know where you heard about the program so that we know what's working as far as getting the word out about things like this. Okay. Let me close that down. All right. So now we're gonna try something a little fun. I'm gonna, <laughs> I hope this works, okay? I've never tried this before, so bear with me. Um, there is something called a word cloud out there, and I saw somebody else do this on a program, so I thought I would try it. So what you need to do is go to www.menti.com and enter this code. And Tess, if you're there, would you mind putting those things in the chat box since I seem to be having problems with my chat box. Okay, and answer the question to create a word cloud. I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a second. There we go, thank you. I'm going to try and get to that site. Where? There we go. Okay. The buttons on my computer don't like to work. And I should be able to share this when I'm done and show you everybody's answers in a word cloud. See if it works. Is it working? Is everybody, no, oh, hang on, hang on. I think I might have gotten the wrong code. Okay, try this one. Okay. Code and see if it works. It should ask you a question and just type in your answer. And then I'm going to share the screen again. There it is. So it says it up here too, menti.com and use the code 279871. There we go. Let's see what this looks like. Pull it out. <laughs> I like the knot. Sometimes I don't want to weed either. Battle axe. <laughs> Yep. All good descriptions. All good descriptions. Okay. Getting a little bit more in there.
How did I start the poll? Um, if you go to, let's see, let me show you. It's called Mentimeter, M-I-N-T-I-M-E-T-E-R.com. I'll type it in there. So if you go there and set up an account, you can create actually a whole presentation or just one slide like I did so that you can see people's um, answers. You can do a word cloud, but you can also do all sorts of other things. And yeah, I thought it was a nice, you know, a fun little thing to do to see what everybody <laughs> would have to say about their weeding style. Mine is completely not consistent. I Sometimes I go out there and I, I'm a woman with a mission and other times I go out there and I'm like, oh, <laughs> do I really have to do this? So, all right, we're going to get out of this. Oops. Okay, get back to here. And screen sharing. I'm going to have the hang of Zoom a lot after this whole thing is over. Okay. All right. So thank you for having a little fun with me. We're going to continue on. So weeds spread. That's what they do. They spread by seeds, rhizomes, and tubers is another way. Um, Garlic mustard, which we talked about earlier, can produce about 868 seeds per plant. Purple loosestrife, on the other hand, which is an invasive species, it's extremely uh, prevalent in the swamps up near Syracuse, can produce 2.7 million seeds per plant. And when you look out upon the swamps that are completely covered with it in this unhealthy monoculture, which is what invasive species often create, you can understand why people are concerned about this plant. 2.7 million seeds per plant, that's pretty hard to battle against. Rhizomes, like I mentioned, they're underground stems. Many grasses spread this way, but also goldenrod and Canada thistle. Canada thistle, there was a study done, I don't remember what university did it, but Canada thistle is a real problem in some cases because when you see a Canada thistle coming up, it only means that it has maybe 10 or 15 foot worth of feet worth of rhizome underneath. So when you see a little bit of it on top of the ground, the rhizomes below are just incredible, the amount that it produces. And then tubers, ditch lilies, um, you know, I called them tiger lilies when I was a kid. My husband calls them bitch lilies or corn lilies. They bloom a lot around here. They spread a lot. They all spread pretty much from little tubers, um, which are edible, by the way. They taste pretty good. <laughs> so um, just some ways that weeds can spread. So what are you going to do about it? Well, let's see. First, you can eat them. <laughs> eat your weeds that's what I would recommend they're actually really nutritious too if you think about it um, if you look it up you can find out the nutrition information so this is a recipe for um, creamy lambs quarters gratin from Epicurious and the link for this is on the end source too on the, um, the last slide is a slide of resources and we will be able to send you these too. So um, don't worry if you can't jot all this down. But the picture of this particular dish on the Epicurious website looked really delicious. So I thought I'd share that one. The most common thing people do with garlic mustard when they eat it is uh, pesto. It's easy. It makes a yummy pesto. And the funny thing is, Things like dandelions and garlic mustard were actually brought to the United States as a food. That's how they came here. They came with people who immigrated because that was one of their food plants back home. So dandelions came over ages ago and they're, well, actually we eat dandelion greens at least once a week this time of year. 
They're extremely nutritious and you get rid of the dandelions too. Even our dog actually loves to eat them. <laughs> so anyway, you can always eat your weeds. Of course, if you're going to eat anything that you don't, aren't real familiar with, please don't eat it until you know for sure what it is. Feel free to email me a picture because plant ID is one of my favorite games. So I won't, I will not mind ident identifying things for you. So here's some methods of control. Okay, so you have hand weeding, of course, using tools such as soil knives, forks, a hoe, a hula hoe, and a warren hoe. And I'm gonna go into more detail on what these are if you don't know what they are. Uh, chemicals, glyphosate, which is of course the active ingredient in Roundup, homemade mixes and pre-emergent herbicides, which again, all of these I'm just gonna glance through or whatever, and then we're gonna go through in more detail. So smothering, we do a lot of this at our farm. You use plastic mulches, heavy mulching, newspaper, cardboard, stuff like that to really smother the weeds. And then solarizing, which is using clear plastic film, well sealed at the edges to create a searing environment that kills the weed seeds and newly germinated weed seeds in freshly tilled beds. There's a lot of research going on about solarizing right now, including at Cornell University. There's a lady there doing some research and she's finding, finding out some good stuff about this, this method. So we'll go into that too. So hand weeding, I'm gonna turn my video on for a minute. Let's see, start. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, everybody can see me? This is my best friend. <laughs> this is called a soil knife. And I never knew what these were till I worked at an arboretum out in Indiana and we, everybody had one. And they're made of stainless steel um, and a nice solid handle. They're not too hard to find. You can find this one I got at A.M. Leonard, but there's lots of other places you can find them. They're very sturdy. This one actually has a jagged edge, which is fantastic for cutting through really tough weeds. It has measurements along here. So I use this, it's still dirty. I use this in the field, it will not rust. So it's amazing for getting out anything with a tap root or a fibrous root system, you can cut right through it. So that is one of my best friends. Okay, let's see. Yes, the presentation um, will be shared after, after it's over. All right, let me go back to, where was I? There we go. I keep doing things in the wrong order. Okay, so back to this one. Come on, there we go. So that's the picture on the left. That's almost exactly the same knife I have. And then you have a fork. Lots of people have these. Those are really great for loosening um, grassy things. You know, if you don't want to get a shovel at it, if you've got a grass that has a, um, has a big root system, which most grasses do, that's why they made up the prairies is because they held all the soil together. That's why, you know, like the dust bowl, you know, you remove too many of the plants that hold the soil there and the trees that block the wind and you're gonna have some problems with soil erosion through the wind. So forks are really great with getting grass and things with big fibrous root systems out. I use a, a fork a lot along the edges of our beds. Um, a regular hoe I didn't include a picture of because I figured you probably knew what that was. Um, and then a hula hoe, this was a, a tool that I started using a long time ago. It has a cutting blade on both sides. Um, you can get underneath a lot of weeds with this little thing and just cut the roots right off. So I use a, a hula hoe a lot. And my next favorite thing 
is the Warren Ho, which is the pointy one down there in the corner. That one, even though it's pointy, you can use it on its side. It's nice and sharp. I use it to mark out my rows in the beds. And I also use it to, um, because it's so sharp, it goes down deep pretty easily without me having to use too much muscle. And I, I do use it to get weeds out too, big weeds sometimes. But it's also very good to get right up next to your spinach. I just used it on the spinach yesterday. And the spinach, our spinach anyway, are only a couple inches tall. So I got right up next to them, nice and easy, cut off all the lamb's quarters. And we also have something called penny crest, which is a pretty bad weed for us. And um, it's, a, it's a great tool. I highly recommend a Warren Ho if you can get a hold of one. We actually found a couple at um, antiques sales for just like five or six bucks. So we're using some old ones, but they have nice solid handles. So we're in pretty good shape. So hand weeding is always an option. Okay, chemicals, glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup and other brands like Cleanup. So Roundup, basically they lost their patent. Their patent expired a few years ago. So people started reproducing the, um, the active ingredient, which is again, glyphosate. So it is non-selective, which means it kills everything. So you have to be real careful. You don't wanna spray it near anything you don't want killed or damaged. And um, you don't wanna do it on a windy day because it will blow on to other things and damage or kill them, okay? Pre-emergence are something you can use in certain situations. So you wouldn't wanna use them in a fresh, bed that you've just tilled and you're gonna sow some seed in because the way pre-emergence work is they prevent the seed from really taking hold. So the seed germinates and then it hits the pre-emergent herbicide on the surface of the soil and just dies. So it keeps it from completely emerging basically. So one thing I discovered when using pre-emergence is that um, it will also affect your ground covers. So if you, you know, you've got your vegetables, so you could maybe use some pre-emergence around uh, seedlings if you're not gonna direct sow into the bed. But you also, in your garden beds around your house, you don't wanna use a pre-emergent where you have vinca or euonymus or any other creeping um, ground cover that has roots that kind of make contact with the soil as it creeps because it prevents, the pre-emergent will prevent the rooting from happening. So your ground cover won't spread. So we found out that out the hard way. Um, and then homemade mixes. There are recipes out there for vinegar mixes or um, Dawn, basically uh, Dawn dish soap is needed because it's surfactant. A surfactant is anything that helps the chemical adhere to the leaf of the plant you're trying to kill. So oftentimes in the Roundup or Cleanup, there are surfactants in it. It's usually some kind of soap-like product, okay? Um, and just a note, Dawn antibacterial, I've actually, accidentally killed plants with it. So if you really want maybe a double, you know, double duty, if you find a recipe online for a mix that includes a dish soap, you could try it, try it with the Dawn antibacterial, It's probably the same price, you won't hurt anything and you might kill more effectively, who knows. So um, there's more again on the resources slide, which I'll go through at the end here about these different options. So those are chemicals, some options. Smothering, black plastic mulch is my best friend. I used to be like, I don't wanna use that. It's plastic, um, you know, it's gonna end up in the landfill, etc. I have been, I have been converted because my husband and I are the only two people working on our farm right now. And there are some, things that we would just not be able to grow because of the rhizomatous grasses that we have. 
So it does kill some weeds. So like your annual and um, perennial seeds, once they germinate, if it's a small little seedling, the black plastic mulch will just fry it. It'll, it'll die. Um, <clears throat> but some things like the rhizome, uh, the grasses that have rhizomes and the goldenrod, it's just going to keep it at bay. So once you take that black plastic up, you'll notice right away that the things that grow through rhizomes are going to come right, right up and start greening up. Okay, so but it's still better than having to go through once you have a bed through bed full of lettuces all sown. And you know, lettuces are tiny, they're um, very fragile. You you come through and you have to pull out this giant rhizome from a uh, goldenrod and you're going to uproot all your lettuces or whatever. So it's a good thing for, for uh, certain crops. It does last a few years. Um, so the cost is not too bad. Unfortunately, snakes love it. In the spring, every year when we move some of the black plastic, I know I'm going to find about 10 or 12 snakes, but we do live in the country. So if you don't live in the country, maybe you won't have such a bad problem. Hopefully not. Now, one note about black plastic mulch is you probably don't want to use it on, well, unfortunately, I use lettuce as an example. Lettuce is a bad example. You don't want to use black pl plastic mulch around your lettuce, but we do use it on cabbages. We use it, um, we, we will sow a row of peas and then we'll take a thin strip of black plastic and put that plastic just below where the peas come up to smother all the weeds that come up below it, below the peas. Um, we use them for all of our zucchini, all of our squash, tomatoes, especially warm season crops, because the black plastic mulch will, of course, warm up the soil. So things like lettuces and spinach, you really, you're going to have to just weed those because if you put black plastic and then plant through the black plastic, these crops that like cold soil or cold temperatures, you're probably going to just make your spinach bolt, you know, right away or your lettuce bolt. So some crops it doesn't work well for. We have found it works okay for cabbage because cabbage has such a long season. So, okay, other smothering options, heavy mulching, Grass clippings work really well in between paths, but also they work really well under um, your green beans. You put on a nice thick layer of grass clippings and not much is gonna get through that because grass clippings lay down so tightly, they just kind of smother everything underneath them. Leaves can work real well too, mostly maple leaves, I would think. Maple leaves compact more than say oak leaves. Um, straw, if you can get weed-free straw, another mistake you're benefiting from, <laughs> I'm telling you about, um, yeah, weed-free straw, you don't want something full of weeds, and then bark mulch, of course, is always an option for mulching, too. So, newspaper and cardboard are something I've seen people use. We haven't used a lot of it, but it does work. You can wet, wet it down and then put other mulches on top of it, or you can just wet it down and, and make sure it stays wet or staple it to the ground. So that will kill many, many weeds. Um, eventually it does disintegrate though, and you might have weeds growing through it, so then you'll have to replenish what you've got. So I know we're running a little bit long here, so I'm gonna try to speed it up. Solarizing is a wonderful thing. Uh, we're attempting it this year. You use clear plastic film. Clear because it lets in the sun's rays, it heats the soil better, and it really gets the temperature of the soil up high enough to kill more things. You have to seal the edges really tightly. If there's any air um, allowed in, then you end up losing the effect of the heating. Um, so you can shovel soil along the edges, or you can use pipes, stakes, or boards to um, seal those edges real tight. You got to till the soil first, then you water it, then you wait for a little while for the first weeds to appear, then you put the clear plastic down and seal the edges. When you take it up in about two to three weeks, that's all it takes, you can then sow your seeds or plant your seedlings 
and try to do it without disturbing the soil beyond a couple inches down. Because if you do that, then you're more likely to bring up more weed seeds that maybe didn't get affected by the solarizing. Although the solarization can reach down to 18 inches, it all depends on how strong the sun is, how many hours of sun, things like that. So this is our uh, bed, a couple beds actually that we're solarizing right now. And that is clear plastic mulch, believe it or not, or film, but it's all steamy under there because the minute we put it down, um, all the moisture from the soil started creating all the steam. It was a nice sunny day. So this is um, a bed that we're going to plant later in the, the season. So we had a couple weeks to do this and see how it works. Not so sure it's gonna work on all of that grass. You see all that grass on the sides of the beds? Oh, so it creeps in. It's very difficult to kill. We're working on it a little bit at a time. We got to get our paths in shape, basically. That will help a lot. So you can see on the picture on the right, the soil, we just, you know, shoveled it up and sealed it in real tight. But you can tell we sealed it well because of all the moisture. Okay, so here's some resources for you. That's most of what I have for today. One of the best books that I've found on weeds is Weeds of the Northeast by Richard H. Yuva. And I have a copy of it right here. I'm going to stop sharing so you can see. Okay. Everybody see that? <laughs> it's backwards, I know. But Weeds of the Northeast, that's kind of what the cover looks like. This was actually one of my books in college. It was a very good one. You can still find it. Okay. So the weeding tools I mentioned, the, like I said, soil knives tend to be hard to find locally. Um, I haven't seen anybody around here that sells them. So unfortunately, you probably have to go online for a soil knife if you're interested in one. Um, AM Leo and Gardner Supply Company, if you want a fun little website, if you've never looked at Gardner Supply Company, it's kind of like eye candy for <laughs> gardeners. Um, they've got some really cute stuff. But everything else, all the other weeding tools I mentioned, I have seen at local stores, but because of social distancing and making sure you don't go out as much as, you know, or as, as making sure you go out as little as possible, make sure you call ahead first um, to places. Um, there's an interesting, every time I mention glyphosate, people you know talk about the health risks and the bees and some of the um, concerns about glyphosate. So that link will take you to an article that the World Health Organization um, authored about some studies done on glyphosate. So go ahead and go there and take a look at it. It's some good reading. You should always educate yourself. <laughs> you should always, always educate yourself. Okay, and then using vinegar, which is also acetic acid, as a weed killer, there's a great resource on uh, CCE Rensselaer's site about how to use it. It can be very effective. So um, vinegar is a, a pretty easy to come by thing, so why not? The, some of the research I talked about that was being done on solarization, there's a site there. And then finally, those two recipes that I mentioned earlier. Those are right there for you. So, does anybody have any questions while, let's see. There's some stuff in the... Okay. Yep, Baker's Creek has um, some good stuff too. They've also got lots of wonderful seeds. Yep, Fiskers has a garden knife. There's a, there's a cute one called Hori Hori, which is a Japanese soil knife and Hori Hori in Japanese means dig dig. <laughs> I always thought that was cute. It's got a nice wooden handle. I know a lady who preferred, preferred that. So you're welcome, Judy. I hope you guys got some good use out of this um, 
program. I'm so, so sorry for all of the technical things we had at the beginning. Um, I'll try to get better for the next one. Next week is um, garden pests. We're going to talk about cucumber beetles and squash bugs and all the little nasties and maybe even groundhogs, which we have a problem with. So um, next week, same time, we're going to do a, a class about bugs and other garden pests. You can definitely email me a picture of some weeds. Yep. Um, just, a, just a tip on emailing me pictures or tests. Um, make sure you get a few shots, not just of the weed, you know, the whole weed. But when it comes to plant ID, you need close-ups of things like the leaves, the stem, and the flowers as close as you can, okay? because there's certain plant families like garlic mustard is in what's called the cruciferae or the mustard family and it's called that because the flowers cross cruciferae you know so things like that help you narrow it down with plant id you go from the family of the plant down so we definitely need you know close-ups okay um has can they still register for gardening the planting with purpose I wish that they could, but we are all out of seeds. Okay. And the next class you do need to go register for in the same way that you registered for this one. So um, our Facebook page, yeah, our Facebook page has an event for next week's class and it has the link there. And you can click that link and hopefully next week, Maybe I'll have Tess show me how to do it. I think maybe I messed up is all that happened when I sent the link out, so. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, in that case, I just want to say, where am I? Here we go. Thank you very much. Oh, there's all the information too. Okay, I forgot about this slide. <laughs> so next week, same thing, six to 7.30. I, I say 7.30, but it should be about like today, about seven o'clock. There's information on how to register. If you want a link, you can just go to the Facebook page and there's a link there. Okay. That'll be an interesting one. I always, I love bugs in the garden. There's so many interesting things out there. So thank you. If you have any other questions, please feel free to drop me a line. You're welcome. Okay. See you next time. Happy gardening. <laughs>